morning, this is Courtney Butler Robinson and I'm here today to teach on how to teach in a four part series that I'm going to do. I'm not great at editing video, I intend to learn more about it as I progress and my life hopefully gets less busy as I retire my school after 10 years this year. But for now this is going to have to do. Okay, first of all, you can find me on YouTube at Courtney Butler Robinson, which you're probably watching now. And then The Deliberate Life is my finance channel, as well as yoga. I'm a big believer in personal finance. Um, I also have a bunch of blogs and a website. If you put Courtney Robinson Yoga in your Google search bar, all of my stuff will come up. And I've been doing this for decades, so there's a ton of information out there on me. Alrighty, first of all, I am teaching today from my book, The Mud and the Lotus, and you can find this practice in the back of the book. Um, the book is basically how to teach or how to practice, and I feel like I have a, um, a benefit in the fact that I was a children's teacher for many years, and when I say children's teacher, I don't mean children's yoga teacher, though I have done that. I was a teacher of early childhood education, and I also taught um, Sunday school to children for many, many years in children's church, and that really helped me to develop uh, my practice and my ability to make complicated subjects easier. So, I am going to show you. On page 122 through 125 in the book, there are these diagrams of practice. Now, looking at a diagram isn't going to help you in the sense of understanding cueing and transition. However, this is a really basic outline for what I have deemed a vanilla class, a basic class for the general population. That does not mean everyone can do everything on here. I'm a yoga therapist and I was trained in that lineage before I considered myself a yoga therapist to modify and adjust to the person in front of me. And so I want to encourage you to do that. And that may take further training. But today we're going to cover just some of the basics. Okay? So that's The Mud and the Lotus, a guide and workbook for students of yoga. And it's by Courtney Denise Butler. That's me. I'm just Robinson as of January. And you can find it at, at aliapress.com which is in Little Rock, Arkansas, or you can find it at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and it's in some stores as well, though I'm not always sure <laughs> where it lands. Okay, the other thing I have, and you can buy these online or from me personally if you know me, are these sample class cards, and they are the same thing that you see in the book, but they're five dollars, and you can get them at, at alia.com as well. The great thing about these is you can lay them on your mat and you can look at them while you're practicing. And so that's really awesome because it's a good way to practice and learn on your own and learn about sequencing in a way that makes sense. The other thing I have here is drawn out is a half sun salutation and a classical sun salutation that you could also put on your mat and practice. Then for those of you who want more information, especially as you get into teaching, uh, this is, I'm not going to say this is a 300 hour level. We teach it in our 200, but I think many yoga teacher trainings don't teach it until higher levels. But this is a coordinating chakra, element, dosha, kosha, bandha, and the impact on the physical body or endocrine system. So if you're in my school, I teach you how to learn how to take a posture and apply this lens, looking through it at this lens to the students. But that's a little higher level, so we'll just um, stop with that for now. But if you're into those things, it's really helpful. And those are at aliapress.com, E-T-A-L-I-P-R-E-S-S.com. Okay. I'll try to put that in the link. Hopefully I'll remember. I want to go over with you, first of all, some basic props 
and things that you can use if you don't have props. Now I was trained with, I practiced without props for decades. I started practicing as a child um, with Lilia Spallon on TV, but I didn't really have a practice until I was 18, like a regular practice. And we didn't have props. And so until I went to yoga teacher training, that's where I was really introduced to props. But back then, there was no internet, so you couldn't just order them. It was really hard to come by. So I want to teach you some things you can use instead of props because you either may be working someplace where they don't have the money to buy them or they're not available. And I don't believe people should feel dependent on props. So a lot of what I teach you would be without them, but they can certainly be helpful. This is a yoga block. You can use books instead if you need to. Um, or I can teach, I'm gonna teach you how to use your limbs to modify where you don't need blocks. My friend Kelly, would take cans and wrap them, fill them with sand and wrap them in duct tape and that's what she used for blocks. Or if you know someone who can make you some blocks out of wood and polish them so they don't have splinters, that's easy too. Here's just a basic hand towel for sweat or if you don't have a yoga strap, you roll it and you can use it and it makes a good yoga strap, okay? You can also use karate belts or taekwondo belts. Those work good. This is a regular yoga strap with a buckle. And they're, you know, anywhere from 7 to 20 bucks. A blanket. Most uh, yoga teachers will use these Mexican blankets. They're available just about everywhere, even in gas stations. And they kind of have a texture that keeps you from sliding. But they're really good to use like under your bottom, your knees. Um, for, they're so versatile, but a beach towel or just a throw would work as well, as long as it wasn't a slippery fabric, which that really wouldn't matter too much the way you use them. And then I have a, a yoga pillow that I used to sit on when I teach, but where I work, we just use basic bed pillows. They're actually hospital pillows, but um, a basic bed pillow will work instead of a bolster. Bolsters tend to run upwards of about $30 to $100, and this little pillow is about $50, um, but you can use uh, couch pillows, bed pillows, anything at all. All right, so let's get started on just teaching basic yoga to the general population. So you would start off in a comfortable seated position. That might mean legs in easy posture, which one ankle is in front of the other. And then you would teach people how to sit. So give some options. One leg out, both legs out. You could sit them on a blanket or a pillow or even in a chair, okay? You wanna first start by transitioning. And what I mean by transitioning is moving from the outer world of craziness and all the busyness in our life to the inner world of self, all right? Yoga is the connection of the mind and body, or and, let's say and, the connection to that which is higher or bigger than just you. Your connection to nature, God, the God of your understanding, the universe. But it's, it's that inner self that comes into us when we're born and leaves us when we pass over. So, yeah, that was a lot for beginning, wasn't it? <laughs> have a really hard time sometimes staying on course. So we want to start, it can be as simple as closing your eyes and breathing, or it could be something like, you hear often, we're going to set our intention. So oftentimes setting my intention is simply be here now. I'm going to be in this moment, in this present moment now. Or I am today setting my intention to be peaceful and joyful. Okay? It could also mean acclimating to space. So what that might look like would be notice your seat on the floor. Get grounded through the floor. Feel the length of your spine and let your shoulders soften away from your ears. In your mind, visualize the room that you're in, the mat that you're sitting on. Usually, I'm going to use a combination of both. Let's do a quick little practice with that. So sit comfortably, whatever works for you, with a nice straight spine. 
Now in yoga therapy, sometimes people don't have the strength to sit up, so I prop a chair behind the back of a chair on their back. So I'm going to turn my palms up because this is calming to the brain. And I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to begin to take some nice deep breaths down, down into my pelvic belly. Exhale and let it go and just connect with your breath. Now even though we breathe into our lungs and out of our lungs, yoga teaches us that the breath body is all pervading. Breath moves in and as we exhale, the carbon dioxide moves out, but the oxygen goes into the bloodstream. It's okay to say breathe into your belly. Shoulders relax away from the ears. We feel our seat connected to the earth. You might even feel like down through your tailbone and through your seat, roots connected down to the center of the earth. Feel the length of your spine being lifted through the crown of your head, your shoulders open. Your shoulders relax as the breath moves in and out through your body with nature's natural rhythm. Good. And then, if I'm going to have them open their eyes, I may have them take their chin down and gently open their eyes and look back up. Because when people are opening their eyes to come back to class, that optical nerve from your eye to your brain is taking in a lot of information. So if they can look down first, it's a little less shocking than looking up at a bunch of unfamiliar faces. Even if they're familiar, it's just kind of awkward. So you got to think about those little details. Those little details are what makes a good teacher. Okay? It doesn't matter how good your crow is or how long your headstand is. They don't care. They care about how you make them feel. Okay? They care about being in a loving, accepting environment. You want your students to leave feeling like they have done something good for themselves. They need to feel good about what they did. You don't want them to leave defeated. That's really, really important. All right, breathing in. So we could do some head and neck exercises. You know, you could just gently take it side to side. I don't take the head back a lot, uh, mainly because I know too much about stroke risk <laughs> and cervical spine issues, but it might just be about lengthening the front of the neck, okay? Now, you could do the side to side, and normally I'm going to hold these for 15 to 30 seconds. So, like if you did a side, you might walk the hand out. And I'm just going through these to show you we're not doing them like we normally would. I might work down through the body. So, I would do the neck and then the shoulders. Might be shoulder shrug, back, up, forward, slowly with the breath, not as fast as I'm doing them. Bending the elbows, hands out. Maybe doing some circles with the hands. Lots of joints in these hands. Over a quarter of your bones. Right? In your hands and feet. So, flexing and pointing. Or you could do some gentle stretching with the hands on the floor. So, you see I've done neck, shoulders. And with the hands, I also did the elbows. Right? But you could do some elbows. So, think about movement for function. Rather than, I have to do this yoga asana posture because that's what's in the book. Just think about how can I move these joints? Let's talk about joints. Neck, shoulders, elbows, wrists, hands, spine, right? Hip sockets, right? The hips, the knees, the ankles, the feet. All right, so we've moved the upper body now. You might do a little bit of lateral, and you would do this really slow. I'm just showing you the movements. And then a twist. I do not teach going to your edge. My teaching has evolved so much because of the populations of people that have come in front of me. Breathe. Exhale. Back to center. Exhale to the opposite side. Also because I myself have sustained quite a few overuse injuries. Alright, come back. Inhale up. Exhale back down. Oh, isn't that wonderful? I didn't say about the breathing, but we'll get back to that. All right. 
So I've done some gentle lateral and side. Now I might do some um, forward and back. They might be getting tired of sitting by now with if their hips might be getting tired or their back. So it's good to just kind of switch it up a little bit. So here you could do cat and cow holding shins and inhale up, exhale back. So the spine is being moved in all directions. I'm always going to go on the side of caution rather than pushing people. I've torn up my SI joints and my low back because I practiced as a teenager and I was hypermobile and I kept practicing that way and I'm almost 50 now and now I have some issues. Okay? So I've learned. Alright, so I did some lateral leans, twist, and forward and back bends and that's worked my spine in all six directions. Now I'm going to work the hips. Okay? So I might bring my one heel towards my groin and I'll grab the foot and hold on to the calf and just gently rock the baby. Now this might not be good for everybody, so they could just hold and find some movement here. Alright, just some gentle movement. It's called rocking the baby. Well, you know, in my, in my 30s, I started teaching when I was 30. And so I would be teaching, you know, rock the baby, put the foot in the elbow. Do you know how many people can do this? Very few. So you've got to teach. Again, you don't want them to feel defeated. It's not about you. I will often, I'm showing you multiple ways to do this. I will often teach the easier pose. Not what I can do, but what's best for them. Now in this, I've worked the knees as well because I've been bending the knees. So you can just take the knees out and stretch them out. Do some movement here. And then I don't know if you can see my feet from there. but. Sitting up nice and tall in Dandasana and finding some pointing and flexing in the feet. And then out and in. So this is a nice little warm up and it gives you your beginning of your class. So I basically teach two part breathing to beginners, which in the beginning we were doing just breathing in and out to your belly. For the sake of this video, we're going to leave it at that, but you might want to count. Breathe in for four, two, three, four. Breathe out for five or six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Keep it simple. You don't want to overwhelm beginners with complicated moves or breathing. Some people have a lot of stress with just basic belly breathing, so start there warm them up. I generally start with two part breaths by week three or by session three or four I add three part breath and by session eight they're with me for 18 sessions where I work. It's a program that I, that I teach. Um, by session eight I teach alternate nostril breathing so I get them used to things very slowly. You may not have the option to do that but know your audience and that's really important. Alright, so let's transition to hands and knees. So we're still working on the beginning of class, which in an hour long class is about 15 minutes, okay? If you're doing an hour and 15 or an hour and a half, you would adjust. So inhale, and yes, you've already done this seated, but you could do it again. Exhale, round, inhale, exhale, slow. All right, and then you can walk them to the front of the mat. You don't want to keep them on their hands and knees too long if they're beginners because it might be sensitive. They can tuck their toes under and press back. They can raise their leg up. Another option would be to take the hand out. And then, of course, you're going to repeat on the other side. So this alone should take you about 15 minutes. And um, you could add some things or go slow, but you're going to want to do things. And this is just a sample. You guys, there's a lot of ways to teach yoga, but this is a general population sample. And I've taught many, many, many thousands of hours, and this is what has worked for me. Okay? So let's say that you've done um, your cat cows, your sunbird. Now it's often called bird dog. 
and um, the arm out, leg out. And you go into your child's pose. We're not really talking about cueing now, we're just talking about sequencing. Maybe you want to walk it to the left and the right. Stay center. Then you have them come back to all fours. And if it's available to them, you can turn the toes under. They could repeat cat-cow if they don't need to invert. Or you can have them go back to down dog by lifting the knees and the hips back. And the head is between the arms like a frame. You can begin to gently pump, right? Or flex and lengthen. And then you have them come up to meet in a nice forward fold. And then inhale it up. Exhale back. And this is where you will begin to take it to the second half of class. I hope that's helpful for you. My book was written especially to help yoga teachers. There's a ton more information I could give you on the beginning of a class, but those are some basics for sequencing and for getting all of the joints mobile and warmed up and also a nice balanced practice. That little sequence I did alone for 15 minutes could be a nice gentle practice for someone to do at home. They don't have to do more than that if they don't want to. Something is always better than nothing. And the more you do, the better benefits you get. But encourage your students to do a little bit often. All right, namaste, my friends. Take care. Fat